Hello everyone, thank you for sticking around. Such a beautiful day, it's good to be outside. Outside stages are the best. Uh, my name is Robin Waters, I'm from tech.eu. I'm a journalist, analyst, uh, researcher uh, about European uh, tech ecosystem, so it's very, very good for me to be back in person events. Uh, I was in Copenhagen last week, which was my first, and I made this observation, it's very good to see people with legs again, instead of just like on a screen, so good to be back. Happy that you're with us, and we're going to have a really nice panel today about uh, opening new markets, basically expanding across borders. How do you deal with scaling? How do you deal with cultural um, differences when you scale uh, companies internationally? How do you make sure that your values are kept kept intact uh, when you scale companies? Uh, those are the topics for today. We were supposed to have Tom Blumfield from Monzo and Go Cartless on the panel, unfortunately for medical reasons, uh, he didn't make it to Paris. Uh, but we're still going to kick some ass. Um, Every panel starts with introductions. This one is no different. Uh, we're going to kick off with Olivier. Uh, thank you for joining. Hi. Uh, do you want a long answer or a short answer? Uh, we have half an hour, so I'll give you <laughs> two minutes. OK. I'm Olivier Dua. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of WebHelp. Uh, WebHelp started 20 years ago. What do we do? We deliver customer experience, solutions, services, and technology. Our clients are startups and, and large corporations as well, as you can imagine. So we do operate in uh, 60 different countries. And um, it's now a team of 100,000 people. So that's a lot. Can't even wrap my head around 100,000 people. But um, Arthur, you operate in one country, which is a slightly different story, but still quite a fascinating one. So Arthur. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Arthur. I co-founded the first company that was called PriceMatch. I was doing revenue management software for hotels uh, that I sold to Booking. For this company, I actually had to go abroad very quickly um, and, and open lots of new markets on every continent. And uh, now co-founded a new company uh, that is called Penny Lane, which provides all-in-one financial management software as well as accounting software to the accountants. Uh, and for this company, we started two years ago and we are operating only in France for now and actually decided to go deep in France before uh, we go abroad. So for now, only in, in one market for this new company. Um, so before I started TechEU, I was a journalist at TechCrunch and the Next Web. So I've been in the business on and off for like 15, 16 years. And when I talk to entrepreneurs and scale-ups, uh, a lot of the conversations are about scaling abroad, uh, hiring the right talent, finding capital, not always domestically, but also internationally. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of a, a deeper dive into this. Um, obviously, you have lots of experience in scaling internationally. What I always uh, observed is that when people from the outside here, you're scaling to another country, it means that you are expanding, that you're basically building your revenue base, you're diversifying. But I find that oftentimes um, people sort of underestimate that it's also an investment. So when you enter a new market, of course, you do the research, um, you have to find the people, the office space uh, oftentimes. Um, so it is quite an investment to make. So my, my first question to you is, if you decide to enter a new market, what are some of the things that you decide before you head there? Like, what are some of the things you need to know and which metrics do you find important before you decide, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to make that investment? Well, first of all, I would say that it's very linked to your strategy. Um, and if I share my, the experience we had at WebHelp, at the very beginning, we thought, and when I said the very beginning, it was the first 10 years, we thought that it was not a good idea to actually to go elsewhere and, and, and to dilute the resources and to spend some more time, you know, expanding the geographical footprint. Why? Because in my industry, I thought at the very beginning that the most important thing, so it was a very strategic matter, was to be number one in your domestic country. So all the resources, you know, all the cash, all the time and the energy was really dedicated to, we want to be number one in France, instead of being number 10 in 10 different countries, because it didn't make sense. And then the market has changed, thanks to the, the digital and, and the newcomers in, in the digital space. Uh, we find out that our clients of today and tomorrow will be very international clients like the Amazon and the Apple and uh, you know, all the digital native company. So to, to be a partner of those guys, we had to be very international as well. And we say, well, we cannot be too multi-regional. We have to be completely global. And then we decided, like 10 years ago, to accelerate the expansion and to expand our reach. So in our case, it was very linked to the strategy. How do we 
make sure that we build a competitive advantage. And in 20 years, actually, the perception of like, the importance of being global has completely changed. Arthur, similar question to you. Of course, you operate only in France for now, but I'm sure you've looked at um, you know, opening up or in other markets. So what are some, some of the things you look or you will look at it when you finally make that step? So I think I first fully agree with Olivier that the first thing that comes is strategy. Um, I think nobody should like ignore the fact that launching a new market will be a loss of focus. That, that has to be true. Uh, and so I think for me, the real question is, is your organization ready for a loss of focus or is it too early? And the second question I think is back to the strategy. Um, how big is your domestic market as well? So in my first company, Price Match, uh, we pretty quickly realized that our market was hotels being in rather busy cities uh, or busy regions and that we actually could better serve a hotel in Berlin than a hotel in whatever, like third, third, second or third year city in France. And so it just made sense to you know, go abroad for that reason. Uh, with that, our current company, uh, accounting is very local still, market by market. Um, and so it takes quite some localization effort to make your software ready for Belgium or uh, Italy or Spain. And so, because the market is also so big, um, just in France, we think we can get to one billion in revenue, just in revenue. Um, we first want to really make sure we get that inflection point where we feel nobody can stop us in France before uh, we actually lose some focus and start replicating in another country. Um, you've scaled to 60 countries, 100,000 people. That means you've done a lot of things the right way. Uh, I'm sure you've also made mistakes along the way. Uh, so what are some of the key things that you've learned from the things that have not worked out uh, when you expanded to new markets? Um, I think that the biggest mistakes are the thing that I haven't done and I should have done. You know, it's like regretting things, uh, especially in M&A, something that we, we have not actually uh, discussed, but you can expand Greenfield, you know, by yourself or by m and And in the story of WebHelp, we did half-half. You know, um, so we did a lot of M&A, and, and um, things that I can regret today is maybe opportunity that I miss. But if I had to do things differently now, I would say that there's a high correlation between um, the level of success of an acquisition and the size of the target. So I think we, we bought you know, almost 25 different companies in, in, in many countries. And the biggest mistakes were uh, really on, on, on the smallest target. And we think that because it's, it's, a, it's a small target, it's a small company, it's going to be easier to due diligence, it's going to be easier to integrate, it's going to be less risky. But at the end, it's the opposite. Because when you buy a 200 million company, you know, you're not reaching 200 million by chance. That means that everything is solid from the floor to the roof. Um, when you buy a 20 million company, you know, it's, it's more fragile. And, and the mistake that we did, if I look back on, on the acquisition that we have made, I think that we have bought two small companies. So I would recommend, you know, if you want to grow your business and you can do it by acquisition, you know, think big. Think big fish. Uh, any learnings from uh, your previous company in that sense? Um, not so much. I mean, we've also done m and I think it's good to consider that option uh, with, with our previous company. What I, back to the topic of today, of keeping your values. So we actually don't operate in any other market than France, but we actually hire uh, tech talent anywhere in Europe. And we've been operating our tech team remote first since day one. Um, and we now have about 30% of our tech team, which is in any country. So we don't have any hub. It's really anyone working from home um, or from a co-working space. And I think you should not underestimate you know, the, the importance of having a very strong culture, very strong DNA, so that the people that you're going to integrate or hire or uh, abroad actually understand very clearly what it is to, to be an employee of your company. And, and not lose that sense of belonging that you had when you were just like a small number of people in one, one country. Um, so to, the, to the, the title of the session, I think having a very clear strategy and very clearly stated values is key before you do anything. I think we're going we're, we're to come back to that in a second. 
Is it still working? Yes. It's, it's all good. Uh, so let's stick uh, to the topic of M&A for, for a second there, because um, you're right, of course, you can do organic growth, greenfield, or you can grow through acquisitions. There are many types of acquisitions. You can do. You can buy market share, you can buy talent, uh, or both, of course. Um, now, in the acquisitions that you've done in particular, because you've done quite a few, how do you manage to communicate that culture, those values that you sort of built up over many years, and leading by example, how do you communicate to a team that's entirely new and entirely fresh to the company and, and the strategy? Well, first of all, you don't want to buy a company where the management team has you know, a set of values that are too far away from your own set of values. So you have to make sure that you cannot be aligned on 100%, but you, you have to make sure that the core foundations, you know, the values, uh, the, the visions, and the way you want to operate, the way you want to differentiate, you know, you have some similarities. So it starts by making sure that you choose the right team at the beginning. And that's an investment of the founder of the CEO for sure. You have to invest a lot of your time to make sure that you understand the management team that you are in front of you. Then that's something that we, we do too late when we grow a business is to formalize the corporate culture. I think that's it's something that is natural when you start up, you know, you have a culture, but you're not aware of it and, and you're not formalizing the, the culture. And it comes to a point where it's key and it's strategic actually to grow your business by keeping actually the corporate culture and by leveraging the, 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 the strength of the corporate culture. So you have to formalize it and you have to communicate, you have to incarnate your values and you have to make sure that, because it's something that is very difficult to to process, you know, like a, a culture in the company is like education in the family. It's like, you know, what's left when the parents are leaving the room or when the boss is leaving the room. So it's difficult to formalize, but you have to force yourself to formalize it as much as you can. And of course, to incarnate it, to make sure that your first layer of management, you know, really incarnate those values. So that's key in the success of an acquisition or when you go abroad, you have to invest massively in what we call the soft skills. Is that something that resonates with you um, as a younger company, obviously? Yeah, so I think I will, I will mainly touch on the first experience I had um, and mainly more on when we got acquired by a big company, uh, which was Booking.com. Um, so we then spent three years at Booking. I think what Booking has done really well is first offering all people that wanted to actually relocate to Amsterdam uh, and actually force the founders to relocate to Amsterdam, which I think was really helpful to you know, make sure we we their values and their DNA and operate at the, at the heart of their company. Uh, I think then what was key was really to define, like align the vision and define the strategy. Um, also making sure, you know, we understand why we are joining forces and, and how that fits into the larger picture. Um, so yeah, I, I would, for the rest, I would just totally agree with uh, what Olivier just said. Now, I live in Brussels, which is sort of in between Amsterdam and Paris. So I'm not going to make the mistake of saying those cultures are, are the same. Uh, but they are relatively similar, especially in Western Europe in general. They're quite the same. Now, if you buy or, or expand to countries outside, Southeast Asia, Latin America, for example, um, how big do those cultural values, or those cultural differences, uh, weigh in on sort of the process and, the, and whatever happens after the M&A? Well, that's something that we, we realize, you know, when we expand is the cultural differences. I'm not, you know, mentioning the corporate culture, but the culture of a country. And um, you have to understand and manage differently. You know, you, the way you work with, even in Europe, with uh, German, with Spanish, with British, with French, with Turkish, it's completely different. And when you move left or, or, or right, as you said, you know, in Latin America or you're going in Asia, you have to understand the codes, the, the, the way they behave, and you have to adapt your management style. Well, that's something that I will recommend, because you tell me they, you know, have to pass some messages to the audience, is read a book that is called Culture Map. Culture Map is written by a lady called Erin Meyer, and she's also the co-writer of the last uh, Read Asking, the founder of Netflix, uh, No Rules Rules. So before that, she wrote uh, a book called Culture Map. And actually, she explained, and it's very well documented and very useful when you expand uh, in other regions, you know, all the differences of behaviors. And she takes example of moment of truth in business, like, the way you give feedback, the way you express leadership, 
the way you're going to say that you disagree, uh, the, the decision uh, process and everything. And there are big differences, you know. For example, you have the, the low context culture where the communication is very clear and very concise, like in Western countries and in the United States. And you have the high context culture, like in Japan, where actually it's more subtle. You have to read between the lines. When you get feedback uh, in France, you can be very direct. And uh, if you want to um, disagree, you know, it can be conflictual. We're fine with that, uh, like the German. But the French are emotional. The Germans are not emotional. And when you read, actually, you know, all the differences in those moments of truth, you understand how you have to adapt, actually, your style and how the first thing to do when you expand is to be a good observer. It's better to be a good observer than to be a good speaker. Uh, Olivier, if you don't mind, I'm going to stay with you for, for a second there because I'm also interested in knowing if you buy companies, let's say in Southeast Asia or, or you expand to Southeast Asia, um, how important is it to have local management really, really know that market deep down? Because sometimes it's sort of an obvious one. Of course, you need to know the market. But sometimes I hear, like, if you come in fresh and with fresh eyes and you don't know anything about the market, sometimes it gives you a competitive advantage because you don't really care about the rules. You just sort of disrupt the market in a way because you don't know it. Um, which one uh, weighs in more? Well, the, 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 the rules we have applied so far is um, to build a team and to have a mix between uh, local people that know perfectly well their local environments and uh, people from the company that have been with us for long and that know very well the corporate culture. Um, and, and I like this kind of mix because, especially in my business, you know, it's business services, it's B2B, it's people intensive, and the legal environments are different, the labor laws are different, there's a lot of characteristics, local characteristics. So you want to make sure that you have people, local people, that know perfectly well the rules. But then you have to connect all those people to something that is skeleton. It's, it's, it's like uh, the central bone, and, and that's where you need your people. You need your own involvement and uh, make sure that you know, the funders and the, the CEO and the top management is very involved. But if you can send people that have been with you for long, that know perfectly well you know, the company, that's even better. Arthur. Uh, Arthur, you're in the financial services industry, which is, of course, heavily regulated. Um, over time, when you will expand to new markets, how important do you think it will be to really sort of nail down those regulatory issues and barriers uh, to entry before you make that move? So, so maybe just to come back to the, to the last question, I think we have a chance to do something quite different um, because we are still small and, and pretty young company, which is that remote first thing. Um, so my CTO, Quentin, he used to, to manage a couple of teams at Booking. So Booking is a very centralized company. Everyone had, every engineer had to relocate to Amsterdam. There were just three, we had like 2,000 engineers in Amsterdam. And there were just three offices outside of Amsterdam, one in Beijing, one in Seattle, one in Tel Aviv. Quentin was actually managing those three offices. And his takeaway on, on remote work or at least having like one big central organization and a couple of satellite offices with that it doesn't really work um, and that the only way to make it work is to be remote first uh, and that it's the only way to have really equal everyone completely equal uh, and that there are not like two leagues like those that have the coffee machine conversations and the others uh, do that are the, at the headquarter and the others and the second thing was especially at a young company Lagas having the same time zone to even if you are in different places, have easy, fluid collaboration uh, and being able to bring people together in the same place on a frequent basis. Um, so that's why we, what we try to apply, um, even if we hire people everywhere in Europe, that it's remote first, for tech at least, um, and, and that we bring people like every month and a half or so in Paris. And so now to answer your second question about the, you know, the regulatory side of things. Um, so we are not that much regulated uh, because we really just provide software. We are not a bank, we are not something like this. Um, we actually partner with people that are banks, that are credit companies and stuff like this. Um, the main effort we need to do is actually understanding the local complexity and specificities of accounting and fiscal rules, VAT, etc. And we need to local, it's very fun. Uh, and we need, to, we need to localize for this. Um, 
The good thing is that France made it pretty complex. <laughs> so usually every other country will be more simple than France. So that, that's the good thing. It's also, I think, why like a company like Payfit started in France and was able to then, you know, for payroll to expand to other, other markets. Um, and I think that accounting within, so we only aim to become like a continental European player. The, the market's big enough for this. Um, and we think that continental European accounting is significantly different and more complex than accounting in the UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, where we have some competitors that have done really well. Uh, and that it, we, are, we are actually better off starting from a blank sheet and building a, a product for Europe. Um, and, but you still need to localize. So there we'll need to hire some German accountants, uh, Spanish accountants, etc. Uh, and have them work efficiently together with our product teams, engineering teams, etc. Well, now it's my turn to come back to your first uh, answer about remote first. Um, I hear that a lot, obviously, but for startups and scale-ups, it's relatively easy. It's sort of in their DNA already. Uh, what I wonder about is how a CEO of 100,000 people uh, actually manages to you know, make that switch that was sort of forced upon you last year. Uh, to go sort of outside the office and use uh, all these online tools. I'm guessing you were already quite, you know, went through a digital transformation on your own in 2000. Um, but I'm wondering how it changed sort of the the day-to-day -day operations uh, within Web Help. Well, actually, that uh, we 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 did something that uh, we thought was not possible, and even a client, which is to have uh, like 85,000 people working from home. And um, we did it in, uh, in a very limited number of days and, and, and weeks. Um, we had a chance to do it by web. You remember that the COVID you know, started in some countries and, and started to move. So we, we had the time to organize. But technically speaking, we didn't know that it was possible you know, for question of communication, telecommunication, bandwidth, and everything. And actually, we find out that it's not so complicated to rebuild a very secure infrastructure, having people working from home. So the resilience of our, there was a proof and the evidence of the resilience of a business for us. Um, uh, we were convinced that we could do it, but uh, it was an evidence at large scale. You know, it's a question not to have 2,000 people working from home. It was much more than that. And, and it was, uh, you know, uh, an occasion to, an opportunity to, to demonstrate that to our clients as well. Um, so we did it very quickly. And that's going to change the way we deliver the service to our clients. You know, on long ter on long term basis, I think that that's going to change completely the way we operate. And I can see it now that our clients say, you know, we we want to put in place something that is much more flexible with part of the team working from home, part of the team working from premises. And we have launched something that is called Web Help Anywhere, which means that we put in place all the technologies and everything to make sure that wherever you are, you can serve the client you represent. So it's a game changer, actually. The COVID has completely changed uh, the way we operate. One of the things with uh, all this remote working is that a lot of companies can now hire anyone they want. They can raise funding online, which you, I understand what you've done with Sequoia as well, mostly online. Um, but it levels the play playing field for everyone else as well. So how um, competitive does it make sort of this war for talent and war for funding now that, you know, it doesn't really matter where you're based anymore? Uh, Arthur, do you have any thoughts on that? I have. Um, so we actually are still hiring for our head of talent acquisition at the moment role. So I'm the one actually operate, like doing this role at the moment. So I'm pretty deep in, in, this, in those questions. Um, I think what is funny is that Many people don't realize like the war that is taking place, especially for tech talent, especially I think in Eastern Europe at the moment. I'm so what, what we decided we would pay like the fair market price uh, for engineering talent depending on the country, and pretty quickly I realized that probably you will all be surprised. But right now, if you want to hire an engineer in Poland, uh, you probably have to pay 40 percent above an engineer in France. Um, Romania would be like same as France, I would say. Um, my interpretation of it is, I think that the French market, because of the labor law, is actually protected. And you don't have many companies from abroad coming and trying to poach uh, French tech talent. 
while I think American companies, German, UK companies have realized that remote is possible and they come with, they, they start very high because I mean, the, I, had a, I was attending an event last weekend, I was being told by the startup in the Silicon Valley that right now the, when you hire someone out of a, a big engineering school like in the US, uh, you have to pay them 250K starting salary and it's like 500 after four or five years. So they come from there and I think they are ready to you know, pay you know, half of it in Eastern Europe probably. And so I think it's only gonna go up um, so I think the three next years are going to be wild, given the amount of funding that is that we see every day in the news. So, um, in one sense, it might be good for Europe. I mean, it might just like, as you said, like level the playing field. I don't know if it's for all roles or just for a minority of like tech roles, for example. Um, but what is sure is we are going to be have to be very agile and probably like readjust salaries and offers like every week or so. I think. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. That's one minute each to share sort of in a nutshell the lessons you've learned in scaling abroad and, and how to sort of translate those values when you scale abroad for the entrepreneurs or the aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience. Uh, one key takeaway maybe to, uh, to prepare and to formalize as much as you can before actually s expanding or entering or tapping a new market. I think we, we used to say as a when you started that you have to be very agile and very flexible, but you know, agility doesn't mean improvisation. You know, so when, when you go abroad, you have to spend a good amount of time actually in preparation just to avoid improvisation. So there's a lot of things that you have to do well in advance before really starting to expand. So do your homework. Arthur, last minute is all yours. Um, so I guess if, if we have people that are relatively early like us in, in their company stage, uh, I would really advise to maybe like start by hiring people abroad, even if you don't operate abroad. It will force you to switch your company to full English, will force you to you know think of culture and differences in culture between different countries. And then maybe in the second time you can actually go and operate business abroad. I think it's a good you know sequencing of, uh, of things. And other than this, I would just, you know, reiterate what uh, Olivier just said, I think you need to go prepared. Uh, you need to make sure you have very solid foundations. Um, and then you need to move fast, um, I guess. Great. Well, that's all the time we have. I hope that was valuable for you. I thought it was an interesting conversation, at least. Uh, Arthur, uh, Olivier, thank you so much for joining. I uh, wish Tom would have been here. Uh, maybe he's watching. Uh, I don't know if he's being streamed live. Uh, but hi, Tom. Maybe next time. Uh, but that was very valuable. Thank you very much. Thanks thank a you. lot.